Good evening and welcome to the Arlington School Committee meeting. It is Thursday, March 26, 2015. I'd like to welcome my fellow committee members and AE, AEA Representative Siobhan Foley. Uh, Mr. Schlickman will not be with us tonight. This is the last school committee meeting I will be chair of, and I would like to thank my fellow members and the entire administrative staff for their support and understanding when I occasionally faltered. I would like to recognize Ms. Karen Fitzgerald, the school committee secretary, for keeping me on point and all the extra work she does for the entire committee. Thank you very much, Karen. At this time, I'm gonna do something that some of you may have wanted me to do the first night I did it. I'm gonna recommend that you stop watching us and catch this meeting at a later uh, taping from ACMI and attend the White Ribbon Campaign at Arlington Town Hall in the Lions Hearing Room from 7 to 8.30. Jackson Katz, TED Talk video, Violence Against Women, it's a men's issue, will be shown. Following the video, there will be a group discussion led by Selectman Joseph Curo and Craig Norvig Baum. White ribbon pins and light refreshment will be available. Okay. <coughs> At this time, I would, and it's gonna be a little bit confusing on the artwork tonight. I would like to uh, have you take a look at the portraits over here. Uh, sixth graders uh, on this board from Ms. Serafini's art class were taken not only as a way to display the incredible work done during the Mad Hats lesson, but also to give you a sense of how proud and happy the students are in the art studios at Audison Middle School. And our studios kids get the chance to express themselves, something that is so crucial to their development at this age. Students not only plan, prepare, and manage their individual projects, but also work in groups to find the most creative solutions to challenging questions. The display on board three, which is back here, our numbering is a little different, shows students work collaboratively to create life-size human sculptures that will be exhibited during a three-day installation this spring. The kids are hungry for a chance to do hands-on creative work. We are working hard to make sure the Audison Art Studios are an inspiring, exciting place that gives every student the opportunity to explore and create. Lastly, the sculpture right here uh, of a creature made by eighth grader Maya Rothenberg was created as part of a big little project. Eighth graders used the drawings of kindergarten and first grade students and turned them into sculptures. This was an extremely exciting and successful collaboration and the work is currently on display in the Robinson Fox Library. Now I've got you turned around, you gotta come back over here and this piece that I'm gonna read is about this board here and the board in the back of our room. The art displayed here is created by students in Ms. McCory's, Mr. McCory's sixth, seventh, and eighth grade art classes. Students in the sixth grade explore narrative observation drawing and experiment with multimedia techniques to create original expressive self-portraits. Students in the seventh grade use photography and complex grid system to draw self-portraits. They also explore contemporary art, making aesthetics and techniques to develop interpretive maps of specific places. In the eighth grade, students use block print making to develop and print personal logos and explore contemporary uses of positive and negative space to redesign their favorite book cover. Art's come a long way since I went to school with the eight Crayola crayons. Uh, at this time, I would invite uh, uh, we're going to have a presentation, technology one-to-one -one pilot presentation. Dr. Bodie? Yes. I invite the, uh, the, the team up here, the 610 cluster from Addison Middle School. D did you want the, the screen down? Yes. Yes. Okay. <coughs> well, let me, d I'll, I'll have them all introduce themselves in just a second, but just as, a, as some background. Last year, last November 2014, which wasn't that long ago, the, 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 this 610 cluster, which is a sixth grade cluster at Audison, um, began a new technology pilot for the middle school, which is going to have, uh, be very instructive for us as we go forward in the years ahead in terms of actually how we want to um, use technology in the middle school. Um, each student was provided with an iPad, so we have a one-to-one -one environment. The only other um, uh, really uh, group that has a one-to-one -one is the Thompson School. Throughout the pilot, the teachers have been collecting data um, and how technology impacts instruction. And they have been uh, gathering this evidence over the last few months 
with the uh, final report coming out sometime this spring. And uh, the results of this report are really going to inform us in terms of how we move forward with, with um, technology at Audison in the years to come. So I'm going to turn this over to them and let them introduce themselves and then I'll, they can go forward and tell us the great things that have been going on there. Allison, you want to start? Um, Allison Sansonino, I'm a history teacher in the six tens. I'm Lillian O'Donnell. I'm the special education co-teacher in the six tens. I'm Jessica Kalishan. I'm the English teacher in the six tens. And then Joanna Bond, the math and teacher in the six tens. Okay, so um, as you can see up here, this is our one-to-one -one iPad pilot. We took um, data. We polled our students at the beginning and the end of last year. Uh, as well as parents. And we collected this data and asked them various questions about the impact of iPads in the classroom. And you can see here 97% of parents last year felt that the iPads had a positive impact on their child's academic experiences, while 98% of students felt the iPads had a positive impact on their child's academic experiences. Okay. So what can successful students do? Um, habits of mind from the Common Core. When you're looking at these, and as we um, push further into the ideas of the Common Core, uh, we, we believe that all of these are really important skills that all students must have, and also uh, that technology can really leverage these skills. I don't know if there's anything you want to add, Allison. Um, yeah, so we just feel like these are the skills that kids need, not only to be successful at the middle school level, but if you listen to some of the kids speak in the interviews, they really feel like the technology helps them to be successful. They imagine their job in 10 years and sort of how this technology shapes um, where they'll be in the future. So, and these are kind of the, the skills that we see kind of taking them there. Okay, so uh, I'll speak a bit about how um, using iPads has influenced our reading instruction at the middle school. Um, as we work with the Common Core, we want students to be reading widely and deeply. Um, and students and teachers alike feel that the use of technology has helped students dig a little deeper into those texts, um, partially through the use of apps for reading, where students sort of in a tactile way are able to annotate, are able to look up words they don't know, are able to bring in images or videos to supplement their understanding. And so we as teachers can make those connections for them, but more and more they're making those connections for themselves, bringing in those external resources. Um, it's also been really beneficial um, if we do use a whole class text for students to have audio support who need it uh, so that everybody can access that and we can have a conversation about that. At the same time, um, the reading material is now unlimited. I can always pull up um, a more challenging text for a student who needs a challenge or a text at an easier reading level for a student who needs more independent work there. Um, and I found it very gratifying that 88% of students this year <laughs> currently feel that iPads are helping them as readers, um, both through comprehension and also through their fluency. A few students have come to me and, and reported on that, that their opportunity to, to practice reading, recording for an audience has been helpful for them. Yeah, and I think with the unlimited text, it's also to sort of nurture their curiosity. Mm -hmm. So there's all mm -hmm. sorts of extensions they can do with what they're reading, um, topics they're curious about, topics they're confused about. So it really en encourages them to kind of dig deeply into whatever um, the text is offering them as far as information is concerned. So this is an app that we use quite a bit in the classroom called Notability. Um, this is a history text that the kids were analyzing. So back to what Jess was saying about um, the iPads being tactile and allowing the kids to really physically interact with what they're reading rather than just sort of seeing words on a page and trying to absorb them is hugely impactful in middle school, I would say. So you can kind of see the kids are annotating. Um, they are pulling information out into graphic organizers. Um, Joanna, can you zoom into the picture they put in there? I don't know if you can zoom from there, but if she had the iPad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, in the middle of the text, they took pictures of something I was drawing on the board to put into the text. So, for example, they're learning about oracle bones in China, and I had put on the board an oracle bone, will we have a quiz on this information, and kind of drew the crack. So it was sort of our modern day oracle bone to go with the definition, and then the kids could take a picture of that and insert it into the text for studying purposes. So they can really interact with what they're doing. They can put video clips of lessons from class that accompany the reading. All this is done on the iPad, and then they just save it right up to their Google Drive for access from home. Yeah, I just want to add, um, there's a lot of research about learning and, and the way we absorb information. 
and uh, being interacting with the text in this type of way is beneficial for all learners, especially mm -hmm. our struggling learners. Uh, and this is another platform that I'm just beginning to explore, but I, I think is really promising. It's called Actively Learn. And in this, each student has an account. I can assign them certain things to read, and I can assign questions for that. You can see on the left there is a chart of students' responses to those. Th that was just multiple choice questions, and it sort of tracks it. You assign a certain standard for each question, so it's sort of easy data collection that way. But what I find even more exciting is the opportunity that students have to interact with the text and with each other around the text. Um, so they're able to make notes to themselves that they can share with other people. They can classify those notes. Um, they can categorize them. They can respond to each other. And there's even a little, a little flag so they can notify me if they're confused and I know what to focus on as a whole class. Um, so I think that's very promising. Hello, I'm Elizabeth and I'm from the 610th cluster. And I wanted to talk about iPads. I really love the iPads because we can listen to audiobooks, we can use notability to highlight important factors in reading. Um, so it keeps me on task instead of floating off into dreamland. Um, I love the iPads because I can quickly look up a word without feeling bad about not knowing the definition, and it just helps me overall. So I think what Elizabeth um, mentioned that's great with the reading is that kids can interact with it and they can question and they can get in touch with us without sort of the, the hand in the air, I don't know this word, or how do you say this, which in a middle school classroom can be really awkward for kids. So it kind of gives them another platform to kind of get their questions to us and um, work through what they're struggling with in a way that they're comfortable with. Okay. Um, so I'll also talk a little bit about writing in our cluster this year. Um, so we really do feel that the iPads have redefined the writing process for students. Um, instead of creating notes for themselves and then copying that over into a draft and then copying that over once again into a final copy, usually with p days in between, um, students view this as a lot more immediate. Um, they can plan um, in whatever way they need to, whether that's through using an app to create a, a web of ideas, whether it's through typing up an outline, and they can take those ideas directly into a draft, copy usually and copy and paste yeah. it into um, Google Drive we use a lot. Um, and then I'm able to give them feedback as they go. Their peers are able to give them feedback as they go, so there's not that lag time. Um, so it really does feel like they're learning as they write, not afterwards. Um, and it's also been really helpful for them to be able to write with an audience in mind. Um, they know that, yes, I'm going to see it and their peers will see it. But also we've been, um, we'll show you some, some examples, but using blogs so that their peers will have a chance to comment on their work, their parents can see it. Um, and Allison's, I know it's gonna talk a little bit about the documentary writing. So they know their work is going somewhere, it's not just for their classroom teacher. And I think sometimes putting it into a meaningful context for them, so when we're talking about podcasts or blogs, <clears throat> we had um, one of our students with um, an IEP who was Right, she wrote a personal narrative and then she was recording it in a podcast and then she started to see where you would naturally pause is where you should put punctuation that she wasn't putting. So those sort of like things that you wouldn't even anticipate that actually end up being super, super beneficial to all students. Yeah, and we're doing um, documentary in history class right now using iMovie um, and the end product is something the kids are really proud of but the amount of writing that really goes into a five minute documentary is pretty intense. Um, the amount of research they have to incorporate. And I've never seen kids edit in nine years the way they edit for their documentaries because they have to then say it and record it and hear themselves and their classmates hear them. So they are, their fluency is top notch. Um, so they really just edit so aggressively because they know the end platform is this type of display of their work rather than just the teacher seeing a piece of paper. So it's a totally different sort of experience for them as far as writing goes. Yeah, a level of precision that yeah. isn't always there and motivation, I would say. Uh, so this is just a quick snapshot of one of the book project <laughs> options that my students have this term. And so there are some students, about a quarter of the cluster has chosen to blog about their reading um, throughout the semester, so uh, throughout the term. So this has allowed me to keep track of their reading, for them to have a meaningful audience for their thoughts and their questions, their predictions, and um, 
also a chance for them to comment to get ideas of what to read next. Um, some students have actually ended up reading the same book. They are not even in the same class, but they have been able to have a conversation, asynchronous conversation, but um, about that book and what they might, that student might like to read next, connections they've made to history. Uh, so it's been really rewarding to see. Okay. So one of the benefits of using the iPads along with our spy ponder Google-based email is the, I mean, transformative <clears throat> um, Google Drive and documents that we've used. So every teacher has a folder in which they will share handouts and documents online. We've really become a paperless cluster for the most part. Um, and this is a way that uh, teachers share information with students, students share information with teachers. They all have individual folders to share all their work. If they take notes in class or take a picture of something on the board and they put it in their drive when they go home, it's there. These are skills that are incredibly important and that they're going to be using when they go out into the real world and um, the level of proficiency they have with them is really amazing when you um, when you see where they start out uh, to where they are now and the level of, we do have to put a little bit of effort there at the beginning but then they become like sometimes even better than us with it uh, so then there are other tools in terms of organization such as poplet in terms of organizing ideas uh, there are a lot of different uh, apps and uh, websites that deal with graphic organizers, organizing your thoughts. Uh, the, let's see, I talked about that. Students become more confident learners because the organizational concerns are solved. That's especially uh, students with executive functioning issues, I find. Uh, it can often be most extreme. It's really, yeah, I mean, your, I mean it's it's your frontal lobe is just not, yeah. it's not happening there yet. So, um, they're not carrying around uh, all these their binders as much. They have the papers. They can search for them if they haven't put them in the correct folder. It really puts the emphasis on the content um, and takes away some of these uh, barriers that might have been getting in the way of stu all students learning and learning well. Yeah, and I think it helps us to use class time more efficiently. Yes, definitely. If you look at the agenda in my classroom, it's not find this paper, right. which can often just be this like massive shuffling and searching, and can I go to my locker, and I think it's in my science binder type conversation that would occupy quite a bit of class time, potentially. So it's go to this folder in your Google Drive. That's where their assignments are. That's where their work is. That's what we're doing for class. Their graphic organizers are all digital. So it's just a matter of touching their iPads, and we're there. Um, so I think if we did a study to compile class time and how efficiently mm. it's being used, I think that that would be, um, the organizational piece is huge for that also. For sure. And so students last year said 73% of them said that the iPads improved their organization. I think if we did that again this year, it would be higher just because we've moved closer to being paperless classrooms than last year. Mm -hmm. So I'll talk a little bit about research skills. Um, I think that through the iPads, the kids are developing um, research skills that are really far beyond what I would typically teach in a sixth grade classroom. And I've taught um, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And I think the skills that I'm giving the kids this year are really kind of advanced because the technology is at their fingertips. So we have to sort of in the moment conversations about reliable and credible sources. Where, for example, if I was teaching in the past, that was something the kids had to figure out from home because that's where they're accessing the digital materials. So kids can come up and say, is this a good source, Ms. Nancy? No, we can project it, and we can have a really meaningful conversation, which I think is um, pretty sophisticated for middle school and um, really useful for them later on. So, and also um, multimedia sources. Does anybody know what the top right-hand corner is? I'm sure you're seeing them around. QR, QR. Papa Gino's yeah. has them out front now. <laughs> so the QR codes for research is great. Um, the kids love them. They're interactive. They hold their iPad over it. They scan it in, and it takes them directly to something we want them to read. Um, so those are actually linking to databases from the Robbins Library um, that the kids can use and read. In the bottom right-hand corner, um, there's a picture of Google Slides, which uh, we're using kind of as an old-school uh, index cards for notes where you have the source and then you have the information. And I remember sort of stacking them up and dropping half of them on my way to class <laughs> in high school and hoping like someone found them and having them color coded. So now the kids were using Google Slides app as a way to organize their notes. Um, they can efficiently sort them by subtopic or um, share them. This girl has color coded them pretty extensively <laughs> according <laughs> to the topic she's using in her project. Um, and it, again, that just shows you the personalization of the tools also and how they use them. Yeah. And just to add on to that, um, 
I think students really take ownership over that. I know Allison spent a lot of time setting that up with them as a strategy, and uh, later on in the year, student, we were putting a character on trial in English class, and students were preparing their materials for that, and they, uh, many of them independently decided to use the same strategy. So you see them sort of generalizing it, not just to sixth grade history class, but they recognize that that's helpful in life for them. Yeah, and just to add on to that, I think, um, <laughs> As students see like the color coding or different strategies that are really individual, they start sharing them with each other and talking about different study strategies, different organizational strategies, and are genuinely interested in learning about them because they're uh, digital. So this is the part we could go on forever with, yeah. but um, definitely we think the iPads have increased student um, creativity and overall interest in learning. We have lots of data that we've collected. The kids, we asked kids to talk about who wanted to be interviewed for this, and they were like overwhelming about <laughs> this particular component and us sharing some of their work here. So, some of the big parts of this is just the student choices as a way of showing um, what they've learned. And working collaboratively is so much easier in a digital platform, obviously. They're continuously commenting on each other's Google Docs, and um, if they're working on notes on Google Slides, they're all working on the same. Um, document so they can kind of be adding in their research as a group and it really helps with their communication in that sense. Um, obviously a variety of things that appeal to different learning styles and people's strengths and their personal interests. We're going to talk about Pear Deck in a minute but that's a great tool um, for engaging students in their learning and you can see that the data is pretty strong in this category and I think again this year with how we've implemented these tools it'll be even higher at the end yeah. of this year for sure. I think we've taken that creativity yeah. step even further. Maggie who's in the bottom right hand corner is using um, a new app we just got called, <coughs> well we're not sure, either doing or doing, <laughs> we're going back and forth, but she, they can record themselves like a green screen and put themselves in a location <laughs> to talk about their topic and you don't need to have sort of fancy equipment, it's just an app and you can put green construction paper on the wall. So those sorts of things just get kids really excited, yeah. <laughs> so this is an example of an assignment actually we did yesterday and today in history class just to show you um, all different ways kids can pull information out of an assignment. Um, it's on the geography of Greece. So we started with Google Earth uh, and that's in the bottom left hand corner. And then the kids from there did a map activity, which is done also in Notability. So rather than handing out a piece of paper, they can open it in Notability, color coat. Um, they can mirror in their iPad Google Earth with their map and see sort of how the geography actually looks. Then they did a reading, which is also done in Notability. You can see in the top with the highlighting of the text. And then they had to display that information either in, these are both apps that the kids use. Poplet is the one on the top, which is an interactive web and the one on the bottom is called Paper 53, where they can visualize the geography. So they drew that, right? Yeah. yeah. So this is about two and a half class periods where we went through this whole process, and every student kind of went through this whole experience. And every student is so into it as well. Yes. Like they're just, yes. When I was like, can you share work, it was like <laughs> overwhelming. Please take mine to this presentation, which is really exciting for us. Hi, I'm Kian Sova. I am a 6'10 student, and I really love the iPads because when we get a project, we get to express ourselves in what we do best. And it can be from like doing little skits to doing technology on Explain Everything, iMovie, all that is amazing. And it really makes school fun when you're having a terrible day. Um, <laughs> and what my partner and I are doing for a history project on the Forbidden City in China is we are using YouTube videos and stringing them all together so it creates one big YouTube video. And you may think it's like really easy and stuff, but we have to plan our notes, get our script ready, and then link it together and do our editing and get it up there. So that is why I like the iPads. <laughs> So this is Paradac, which is an app that we're really, really excited about. It's actually a web-based um, platform also, so it's not exclusive to the iPad, so it really could be used in many different areas. Um, in this instance, and I think um, Joanna's going to talk about how it's used in math in a little bit, 
I was starting my unit on Greece, and I was asking them to generate student-generated questions about what they're curious about learning about and topics that they want to explore. And again, this is just one of those tools that allows kids from their device to generate questions. What I screenshot here is what I see, it's not what they see. I can just project from the responses pieces and parts. I can project all of them. I can choose certain ones to bump up to the projector from my hub device. So um, we get pretty much 100% partici participation in any task when we're using Pear Deck because the kids know it's coming to me, it's screening through me, and then I'm projecting up. Um, what they've generated. And it's a great work, way to get classwork grades in just through participation and writing instantly. And also we can give kids instant feedback in it from our device to their device, which is a really great tool. This is just another way they use it when they're analyzing an artifact. There's a draw feature. They can point to different things. Um, I was asking them to tell me what they thought this teaches us about Greek values. So the kids from their device can draw, they can circle, they can label and point to things. And again, you can kind of see the participation level is really high. And I can see in real time exactly what they're doing from their devices as far as the assignment is concerned. Okay. This is kind of my soapbox, so I could talk about this for a long time. That's hence why it's a little uh, dense. Um, but the iPads are an amazing tool for differentiation. I think we were talking a little bit about how it's amazing as an extension tool for some of our maybe more gifted learners, um, but also for our learners who struggle in the classroom. It's, as I said here, it's the ultimate tool, not accommodation, meaning um, it allows the students to take ownership over the process in the classroom and to sort of find methods to work around their difficulties, no matter whether those are uh, physical, cognitive, et cetera. So uh, specifically the iPad versus other forms of technology because it has some amazing built-in accessibility features like built-in speech to text. So students who have uh, fine motor issues, students who have difficulty just uh, putting words to paper, they're able to uh, speak into the iPad and it generates it into words. And the, hot, the, better, the more recent versions of iPads are getting better and better at doing this. Uh, so it increases the written output. There are different um, apps and add-ons through Chrome that can read aloud the text they've written so they can edit for uh, words that sound correct it can allow them to edit for punctuation and grammar. It's really amazing. Okay, and then also text-to-speech readers, which is probably what I use the most with my students, is when they have lower level reading skills, it allows them to access higher level texts. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of students with dyslexia, this is a really amazing tool. So I'll put on their iPad through, we use this app called VoiceDream. I'll put in the English books we're reading, I'll put in the textbooks, and if there's ever an assignment, they can go in, put in headphones, and listen to the text. They can search, they can highlight, they can annotate in it. So it's building fluency, it's reading the text aloud to these students, and it's also really personable. Uh, they can change the font size, they can use dyslexic font that's weighted more heavily on the bottom, they can change the contrast of the screen to black in the background, white. Uh, there's a lot of research that says students uh, actually find that reading through these types of devices is easier for them. They actually have an easier time reading. So I can't say enough about that. Uh, and then also easily shared notes and examples. There's a less focus on copying, more on the actual content that's going on in the classroom since, like I said before, you can put things in folders. They'll have the notes whenever they need them. Um, Joanna has started videotaping herself sometimes with lessons. Students can go home and watch the videos again to review content, it's really amazing. Um, I think this increased individualization with these iPads is actually increasing um, the independence of our students with learning disabilities because they're taking on the ownership of learning themselves and they're able to accommodate those needs that they have um, and do that on their own, whereas before maybe a teacher is reading something aloud to them, now they are taking the iPad and they are listening to it on their own, so it's really amazing. Uh, this is something we already sort of mentioned, but just the different project choices, different modalities of expression. If you have physical needs, sometimes, you know, drawing or writing is very difficult, but being able to produce something on an iPad or just uh, on a computer is much easier for you. So it, it's really helping our students with any uh, learning difficulties, any disabilities, really demonstrate what their strengths are and their understanding of the content 
and again, the executive functioning difficulties, I can't say enough with this whole move to the digital piece. And I think with the project pieces too, it really motivates kids who might struggle with the piece of the process, the research, the reading, the writing, which for a lot of kids can be very daunting tasks when the output is something that's really motivating, yeah. whether it be an iMovie documentary, some sort of artistic group project that's really kind of sparking their interest. I feel that we kind of get them to really push through those steps. Yeah, the more difficult That pieces, in a more yeah. traditional classroom is really grinding for us and for the kids and draining on some of these students. So we kind of get more out of them in those pieces and parts because of these supports that we have in place. Yeah, and, and often these students are becoming so well versed with the technology that they're helping other students and gaining confidence. So that's mm -hmm. amazing to see as well. So these are just some examples. Um, on the left, you can see the, the left and in the middle, this is voice stream. And it shows a little bit about how it can be customized in the middle. So a lot of students with learning challenges might perf be distracted by spacing or too many words on a page. You can change the amount of lines that are shown as it's reading it aloud. On the left is actually something a student wrote. So in VoiceStream, you're able to pull up Google Docs. So say he wrote this essay about Macbeth. He can pull it up, have it played aloud, pick up on any errors. It's a way to edit. It's really amazing. On the right is something um, one of my students with severe executive functioning issues put together um, on the skeletal system. And you'll just see that sometimes allowing our students different ways of demonstrating their knowledge can really be amazing. She she put them all into different categories. She started independently without, um, she was like the first person to try this app. Started putting in pictures and diagrams that she had found from the classroom just by taking a picture. So again, uh, really allows students to meet their own needs and demonstrate what they can do. All right, and so I'm gonna take a moment and just talk about um, how the iPad helps in the mathematics class. Um, the first thing I wanna talk about is how it engages the students within the mathematical practices, and it really helps with all of the mathematical practices. I'm gonna focus in on two of them. Uh, the first is that students are expected to model with mathematics. And I think we've, it's, it's pretty clear, with the iPads, there are multiple formats that students can engage um, across the subject areas with the iPads. So uh, research has shown the more ways students can see mathematics, the more ways they can experience it, the more ways they can explain it, the more ways they can listen to other people explain it, the greater their own understanding is gonna be with these topics. So um, the students uh, had the experience within the classroom they have videos of me that they can access in the classroom at home, videos of each other that they make, um, explaining these mathematical ideas and concepts with the goal of building this long-lasting understanding. We want them to understand the material, not just for the test, but when they see the problem in a different way um, in a few months to be able to take and adapt that knowledge. Uh, additionally, this whole idea that we want students to persevere in problem solving. We want to foster active learners. And the concept of, well, Dr. Bunn, I stopped. I didn't know what to do, so I just was waiting for you is not one that's accepted in my classroom in that I might be working across the room with another student, but there are other students around you. You have an iPad in front of you. You don't know what area means. Look it up. There are examples online, there are definitions online, there are videos online, there are videos from me online, there are videos from other people online. I expect them to constantly be learning. And this is something that's focused on within mathematics, within STEM, within all of the subjects. And this is something that we want our students to then take and do within the real world. We want to foster these active learners, not just in mathematics, but within all of the subjects. And this is, I feel, really, truly one of the great benefits of the iPads. Um, building upon that and what Allison was mentioning earlier, uh, this whole idea of Pear Deck. Oh, and if you just notice to the side there, I have a How to Find Volume video that my students made last year. We were making videos to share, but moving on to talk about Pear Deck. Uh, here I'm an example of a, a live created session that my students helped me make for the purpose of this presentation just to show you the benefit of this particular app. Uh, here I have a program, if, if you look on the right, that's the screen that was being cast, which graph best represents the story. On the left are four different created student answers for the purpose of this presentation. We have two students that are correct, 
And then we have one student on the bottom left that um, didn't at this time have the correct answer. Uh, it's hard with a full class of students to be able to know when a student doesn't understand one particular concept. With Pear Deck, I can ask a question, scroll down and see where they all are on that particular topic. I can immediately turn to that student and say, hey, you might want to take a second look. Or, oh, did you read this particular part of the question and have them address it again? And if they're still struggling, I know that they need additional help with that. Additionally, on the bottom right, we have a student that hasn't answered the question yet. Now maybe they're thinking. Maybe they're doodling in their notebook. I don't know. However, I can now see that, and I can call on that student and say, hey, we're waiting for you. And that sometimes is enough to jostle them into activity so that they can then provide me an answer so I know what they're thinking at the time. So this is just one way to bring the entire classroom together. And with Pear Deck, as Allison was saying, you get 100% engagement because if they're not engaged, I can quickly call them back to what we're supposed to be working on. Which brings me to my next slide, is using class time pro um, productively. Uh, we teach sixth grade. We have students coming in from a number of different elementary schools. I only have them for 48 minutes a day to teach them mathematics. That's not a lot of time, and there's a lot of math that I want them to, to know and to learn. With the iPads, there is no excuse for wasted time in my class. Um, I can individualize assignments. I can work with students that need extra help on something. And in the meantime, I have students that might have already seen that topic and feel really good about it move on and work on different things. I can um, you do this through my website where I can put different activities up. There are also online sites that can then give students questions on the topics that they need help and assistance on while I'm working with other students in the class. So students are receiving that individualized learning experience and students are always working within the classroom. And um, just last year, students completed, an, each student completed, so this is an average, an additional 12 hours of math instruction through these online sites during the course of the year um, because of the use of the iPads. And it's not just um, in my class that they can do this. If they have downtime in another class, they're able to take advantage of this as well. And so here we have a slide on implementing this one-to-one -one pilot. And I think we're all going to talk on this. Um, really the big thing with implementing the one-to-one -one pilot is uh, involving students in the process, um, in making students be responsible for each other, and having these students take a leadership role in what is occurring within the classroom. And we do this through <coughs> like the iPad Council, um, we do this having students help each other with technology issues. Um, oh, a student left their iPad on the desk. You can just say that in the class. Oh, someone left an iPad on the desk. And you'll have three or four other students run to help figure out why is there an iPad sitting on the desk. Oh, so-and-so is just one desk over. And they're all responsible for this technology. And I think that's a huge piece, this responsibility that um, the students join um, with us in taking care of this great opportunity for this technology within our classroom. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah I would just say that um, one thing is the consistency across all classrooms. Like we've set um, pretty specific expectations. You can see them there. That's one of our talented students last year made those for all of our classrooms. Um, the idea that whatever goes in one classroom is going in another, that uh, there's a personal responsibility. I know a lot of people often ask us questions like about whether they get left behind or damaged. The kids are so um, invested in them. that We haven't had one damaged yeah. at all um, yeah. since we've had them. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I think the implementation awesome. part is something that scares people a little bit, and it scared us last year when we thought about doing okay. this. We were. We were excited about it, but nervous about sort of how to roll it out. And believe it or not, there aren't many, many middle schools across the state that have a one-to-one. -one. There's actually very few that we were kind of learning about. And so we were kind of implementing this and learning about it as we go. And I think from that, we have a lot of tools that we can share yeah. with our colleagues. Um, but one of the greatest things is that it's not just our problem, it's that the kids, it's a community sort of spirit to the pilot. So we're not the people saying, put that away, like Joanna said, or get this. The kids are sort of in it together. 
Um, and it, it, as far as student leadership goes, it's been fantastic. So we have kids that check our carts, we have kids that color code things. I mean, they're so invested in all of these different tools that they're eager to help us and support us, which has been great. Um, that picture there, those are our kids from last year who spoke at the Tech Forum in Newton, and they look so small <laughs> on stage. But they spoke to hundreds of people about their experiences, and it was pretty amazing. Um, Some of them came here last year, actually. Yeah, mm -hmm. and spoke yeah. last year. Mm -hmm. So it's just a great, the technology applies to this leadership piece. I was just thinking my class today, usually kids in the class who you want to participate are people who have the correct answer. Today it was someone who knew how to use this yeah. app that I didn't know how to use, that the kids were excited about, and that student got up to talk about it. And that's not the type of student that would typically get up. It's sort of another avenue for leadership through the technology piece, and it's such a high interest area also for this age group. Um, so we felt that uh, our professional development that we took part in last year and this year has been really crucial uh, to making this a success. Um, we attended the iPad Summit um, in Boston last year with more of a goal of how do we implement this. Then we went back this year, we presented with Laura um, about the steps that we had taken and the successes that we had found. Um, and we've taken advantage of some other opportunities at Google, at Framingham State. Um, some teachers will be visiting Burlington, which has a one-to-one, -one, I think it's an entire school, right? District, yeah. yeah. District. So okay. we'll be going to the middle school um, in two weeks. So we are really grateful to have been able to take um, advantage of those resources. Um, and we think that as this program expands, teachers will need to, to do the same. Right, and we're happy to also share what we've learned. And actually in the corner is an example when Jess and I presented um, with Laura Chesson, we put together some resources that we've used in our cluster that we've gathered from different PD. Thank you. Thank you. It, it's a shame you're not enthusiastic about this. <laughs> I envy you, I, I truly do. 40 years ago I started education with the notebooks, with the notepads, losing the cards and everything like that, and I truly envy what you folks have as, as tools going forward. Uh, any questions? Oh yeah. The stocks, oh yeah. <laughs> I got a whole bunch. Um, my first one is, do they get to take the iPads home? No, currently, currently it's not, not right now. But they have, do they all have access to um, computers at home? So you said that when they get home, they have their notes. Mm -hmm. But if they don't have the iPad, how do they have the? Right, if they have, they need to have internet access at home. And are you finding an issue with that? Or are you finding that most students have that? They do, we sent out a survey at the beginning of the year to ascertain that, because we knew that would be an issue, but all students do. Oh, okay, yeah. so they, and, but yeah. they get them when they Last year, up. there were a few who didn't, but they w might go to um, homework club or various other places where they had access to computers and could look at their notes. And right. through the student surveys, we were able to identify that, so we made sure we had printed copies of everything. Yeah. Um, but generally, the students like to stay after school and right. kind of use the digital tools with us, and then we would have those. But I think conducting those surveys at the beginning of the year was really helpful to identify who those families were and how we could help make that. And, and I think a lot of the cr more creative use of the iPads in terms of like making iMovies or explain everything, different tools like that happen in the classroom, not at home. So really th they wouldn't need it as much. Right. Um, how do you guys, like how, how much time did it take you to like, <coughs> how much, if you said, you know, another team is gonna do this, how, about how much time do you think it took to for you guys to get up to speed and learn all these apps and and do that kind of thing? Lots of time. Lots of time. <laughs> um, yeah, last fall was, we were working a lot um, on doing this and learning. And I think the PD that we went to was really helpful. Um, we're really looking forward to get out into other schools this year, like Burlington, and really sitting down with those teachers and thinking about sort of what's happening next because it's been there for longer so we're sort of still in the very early stages of this mm -hmm. so I think we're kind of curious to see okay now we're feeling like we're on a roll right now but what what are we looking what's yeah. next yeah. I think that's sort of still something that we have to gather information about and it's an evolution I think yeah. where we're at right now is very different where we're, from where we were at in November and December and uh, really when we first started out was the idea of how can we substitute the iPads 
in, um, instead of books or instead of you know a piece of paper. And then we started to see more like ways to innovate. And I don't think it's realistic to think that another team of teachers will take it and be at the point that we're at now. Right. But it's exciting, right? And I think students come with ideas, and it's an evolution. And, and one thing that we did say our takeaway with the student involvement is key, and if you can see here too, yeah. um, that we really put the focus on us all learning together. And when you reframe that from us being the people doing all the instructing and it's like we're learning together, that's when yeah, I think it's real really cultural successful. shift, I think. Yeah. That has to happen rather than just sort of like individuals changing <coughs> how they teach. Right. And that's sort of what I think we're learning right now as a group. Well, I mean, yeah, it's a different world. I mean, I think I was at a PD recently where someone said, you know, who was president in, you know, 1855? And we don't need to know facts in the same way we used to know. Like, everyone has that access to information. So it's really about teachers being less the purveyors of all information and more as the guides of how do you access information and learn. Um, how much more prep time do you think it requires you to be prepared with all this stuff? I mean, I love all the differentiation and all the great, you know, things that you do, but do you feel like it takes more or is it just different prep time? I, I mean, I think at the beginning, the more, but different. I mean, what's so great is that you can build an assignment that goes in so many different directions in one assignment, where I think differentiation before this, I'm sort of photocopying four different texts and six different graphic organizers, and I, I'm trying to put together this whole collection, and I can now like link it all into one document. And for me, that's so much more efficient with my time. Uh, and then I give that to the kids, and they're, all the resources are embedded in one place. So I think there's the learning how to do that that I think right. is time consuming. Right. right. And, and once you sort of maybe. yeah learn those strategies, I think it actually saves some time. Um, the lines in the copy room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it. I'm, I'm with you on that. I I don't want to stifle any of this. It's very important. But I, I have lots of questions. I know you Sorry. have a lot, but I want to give a few other people a chance. Two. All right. Well, um, I also want to know if you have enough support for the technology, and if you feel like, um, you know, what what we have in the schools is enough. Like, and you know, does it does it go wrong? Are there days, you know, when you rely on it and it doesn't work? And what more could we do to make sure that it's? I would say the internet has been very strong. Yeah. <laughs> we internet. haven't really had issues with that. Laura has been um, very hands on with us, which has been really helpful. And we've worked with um, Matt Pisano and various Susan, Susan, Susan Bisson. Bisson has been helpful. And now that we have um, Joanna Bradley up at mm -hmm. Audison <laughs> um, in the digital in digi the digital citizenship class, okay. she's been really supportive, and that's just another resource. Um, but I think because we're the only ones right now, we've got like everyone sort of. Yeah, helping. it might be so different. If I don't know more. how that that support kind of spreads out once more people have access to this and how that, that sort of works. I would think maybe more PD up front, like before the school year yeah, started, sure. would be really beneficial. Just so that you understand how to yeah. troubleshoot things yeah. when it mm -hmm. happens? And help set up your systems. I mean, we have a system that I think would work well for all the other clusters. They might want to tweak it a little bit, but for us to share that, <laughs> cut down a lot of the time. Because most of our time at the beginning, which is like, how do you manage the devices um, from one class to another um, at the end of the day? Uh, those types of things. And um, how much time did it take to get the students up to speed? Like, when you did you just start out at the beginning of the year, like, kind of focused on how they were going to use them and where they were? Um, I mean, I think we didn't roll them out the first day of school because they were getting slow. Um, I think we did spend oh, a few days. It was, we definitely spent some focus time. meetings together to talk about norms right. and expectations and we had an administrator there to kind of say you know this is how we all feel like things should go and, and beyond that right. it just sort of the language the digital language that kids pick up really quickly right. I would say and you like don't overwhelm better. them with too many apps or different things at once you know you you might show like how to use this one app using a one 
one project. You wouldn't teach them two new things at once. So we so, sort of slowly implemented them uh, to get them started. And last question, how bad is uh, inappropriate use? Like, do you find that kids are surfing the internet when they're supposed to be doing something or getting somewhere where they're not supposed to be? I think we've only had maybe one to two issues. Yeah, that. it's and so that. isolated. Um, and I think it's they're engaged in whatever we're doing. And we have to be, you know, it's you, you can't sit behind your desk on your device right. while kids are on their device. Yes. It can't be that around. type of situation. Yeah. Right. Um, you've got to be actively circulating. You know, you've got to be moving around the room. And we make the kids have to have, have their iPads face up on their desk, so there's no like kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, just like little things like that, I think, is enough to make kids say, "Oh, someone's watching, and they care what I'm doing." And that sure usually limits those types of. And behaviors. the threat of the device being taken away from them is so great. Like they do, they love them, so they don't want it to be taken from them. Right, right. Kids also keep an eye on each other yeah. as well, because they all have accepted this responsibility. So they'll say, hey, you're not supposed to be on that website. Yeah. And then they'll hey, self-correct. That's cool. Do you, have, do you have any questions? Oh, uh, yeah, I just, um, I think you probably answered this question, but it sounds like many of the tools that you're using are specific to iPads, so that if we were to move to some, like, bring your own device model, mm -hmm. that uh, y it wouldn't be as beneficial, that it sounds. Yeah, I mean, I think. I think we're big fans of the iPads. I think just the tactile nature of it is really impactful. And as you know, Apple has a great platform for education, and they're constantly working on tools that are specific for education mm -hmm. um, that we've incorporated into our classrooms. Um, but I think any technology is better than no technology, and different age groups have different demands and needs. I mean, it would be wonderful if they left eighth grade to a bring your own device where they've seen different experiences with technology mm -hmm. and they can make an informed choice on sort of what type of style works best for them. And in what situation. And in what type of situation. Yeah. Because um, that's how we use technology. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Mr. Pierce. Um, my, my son who's watching on, <laughs> on TV just texted, can he have games when he enters the sixth grade next year? So I, I hope he's watching carefully about that. <laughs> their answer about inappropriate use. Um, I think this is great. I know iPads are limited just by their technological function. I mean, they don't allow for flash. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have a USB mm -hmm. port. Mm -hmm. Do you find that those limitations on the iPad um, make it less desirable than, say, a Google uh, or another type of tablet? I think that certainly the USB not, I mean, I haven't used my USB in years personally. I mean, I just func everything I do goes through Google Drive mm -hmm. or, or the cloud. I mean, that's how I function. Um, and I think a lot of the kids are there too. I think if we said things like that, they'd be like, what? Um, <laughs> but we run into the flash thing on occasion right. um, with certain maybe websites or resources that we want to use, in which case we might just project from our devices. Yeah, or supplement from something. Or supplement from something else. But I mean, I'd say it's pretty isolated. Mm -hmm. And um, some people have concerns about sort of the typing ability on iPads for the kids to write. And it's amazing how the kids have adapted. So sort of what our personal concerns are, what we have a difficult time with, are not, are not necessarily the same as what they have a difficult time with, which is kind of interesting. They're used to texting. <laughs> They're used to texting. They're used to like really small keyboards. Yeah. So this whole typing on the iPad thing, for me, I find it to be a little challenging sometimes. I prefer to pull out my laptop, but the kids don't seem to have that same. And a lot of the kids get sort of an external keyboard also that yeah. they attach onto their device that they like to use. They, they buy that? Yeah, so and we promote the kids to bring their, we have a few that the kids can use and we ask the kids or the parents, we suggest that they buy cases, although school provides them, it just adds to the personalization piece of it for the kids. Uh, two, two more quick ones. Um, you, you find that, you know, screen time is such a kind of nasty two letter word, you know, sentence, screen time. Do you find that if they're in their screens and they're communicating with you via Pear Deck and there's, there's um, less conversation in the classroom, there's less discourse back and forth, you know, that sort of thing worries me a little bit. I, I would say there's nothing more. I would too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, now that they just have something else for preference, you can start with them, what they're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that they're yeah. more engaged because of the technology. Mm -hmm. that And it evens the playing field, I think, too. So before you had your student leaders in the class who were the ones who jumped into discussion first, you could pick them out on the first day of school, and there they were. And this sort of evens it. So I think when you first start with a pair deck or something, and then you ask kids to talk about it, you get the whole class talking, because they've all done it. 
or they've all had a chance to fix their math before the class shares together. Mm -hmm. So that kid who had it wrong now has it right. And then he's part of the discussion. I think that's a worthwhile question, though. I mean, that was maybe a concern that I had. And I think if you came into the classroom, you would see that there it's it's pretty similar to maybe how things were set up before in that you might be reading for a little bit and then you're having group discussions. So there are times when we're not using the iPads. I don't want to give the impression that it's the full 48 minutes, you know, that we'll be on Pear Deck, maybe put it down, maybe they'll be doing a discussion. We still use paper and pencil if that's what the task calls for. So I don't think we're necessarily wed to the device the entire time. Students aren't literally staring at the screen all day. Um, and then also sometimes there'll be several students working on one iPad to put together a project. So if anything, I mean, the level of communication and collaboration among students is significantly higher, I'd say. What's the future for this in the sixth grade, one-to-one? -one? Well, uh, as, as we've talked about before, we pilot and then we expand. I, I don't know if we're gonna be able to do another one-to-one, -one, um, but we're hoping to. We're hoping to, and I think there's also some thought about maybe this going to the the, the cluster that would be half uh, a sixth, seventh, right? Is that some thought on that? Sure. Um, we don't know too much about sort of what's happening next. Um, we hope. Well, we're, a lot we're, work, right? we're working we on it. They're part of the. All, they're part of the, the thinking of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll try and be quick too. Do you think that the iPad impacts the size of class that you can have optimally? Is it, could it, does it have to be smaller? Can it be bigger? Um, how many students in a classroom? I mean, I mean, my class size really varies this year, so I, I'm trying to process this. I have one class of 14 mm -hmm. and a class of 27. <laughs> I'm within the same grade level. So yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think. I mean, there's still a lot of bodies in the class when you put 27 year yeah. olds in a classroom, but I think that it's e maybe easier to manage um, as far as sort of kids always being on task in a larger group because of the motivation, because of the tactile nature of the device, where typically in a class of 27, 28 to 30 in a middle school is, is challenging for a seasoned <laughs> teacher as far as classroom management. And to have this device that does things like Pear Deck or kind of allows them to interact. I think classroom management wise, it definitely helps um, with student engagement in a larger class. Okay, that's really helpful. And then the other was just a comment. Um, I'm not sure if people read through the presentation that you gave, but they mentioned how much more math instruction the kids had gotten and it's equivalent to almost three weeks worth of additional school for math. And then in another one, they mentioned they were three weeks ahead in their curriculum. And so this is a pretty cost-effective way of gaining time. The, the mm -hmm. 12 hours of additional time um, in school and at home then work on the online activities. Just mm -hmm. on that. OK, thank you. I quickly want to preface what I'm about to say. I'm 100% supportive on it. Mm -hmm. But I'm also a sci-fi nut that is scared of technology <laughs> to, that overtakes. Uh, you've already addressed one part about the interaction with people. Mm -hmm. and, and I've seen that with kids when they get excited, stuff like that. How dependent, is there a concern of dependency on the individual tool? I mean, the greatest thing for me was spell check because I'm such a bad speller, except when I come to homonyms. I always pick the wrong one uh, for it. But I mean, uh, do kids go to Wikipedia the way I went to the encyclopedia and just cut and paste? You, you addressed a piece of that. I think what the research has actually been kind of interesting because we've the kids have encountered real life problems with researching online that are true. I mean, Google is not a great tool for researching. and. It take, you can tell them that all the time, and the first thing they do when they go home is Google <laughs> something. And to be able to have that conversation in the classroom has really, I think, as a result, pushed them back towards books, because they'll bring me a website and they'll say, is this, can I use this, is this reliable? Well, who published it? Well, we have this conversation. It's a, it's a long conversation, because you really have to figure it out. They're exhausted, and they're like, I still don't know if it's reliable. <laughs> and I'm like, well, what do you know about a book? It's reliable, and then there they go back to the book, which is sort of interesting. We're able to have those conversations right so in class. You still have to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction initially, 
Yeah. To build, yeah. To, to, for the skill development on, on that aspect. Yeah, and I think that's what's so great about having the device in the class, okay. is that it's tough for kids to determine that, those types of things from home. And I don't think they have those conversations. They just guess, you know, oh, it, it has what I'm looking for. I'm going to use it, yeah. sort of. But then you'll also project it and then yeah. model that conversation with the whole class, too. So I think so they're being reinforced. Those some ideas. things haven't changed. I, I used to find it in the encyclopedia right away, cut, <laughs> copy it, and, and go, and then get nailed. Yeah. I want to thank you for your enthusiasm. I'd like to commend to the superintendent your, your excitement and enthusiasm. I think it's Terrific. contagious. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Arlington is very fortunate to have all four of you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. At this time, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Laurie August and Evelyn Smith DeMille, Sanborn Foundation. What we're going to do here is first I am going to introduce myself. I'm Evelyn Smith DeMille. I am the executive administrator for the Sanborn Foundation, the formal name of which is the Elizabeth and George L. Sanborn Foundation for the Treatment and Cure of Cancer. We exist here in the town of Arlington. Our mission is to assist Arlington residents who have cancer to get the things and the services they need. What I'm going to do is ask our president of the board of directors to make a presentation tonight in a recent conversation I was having with Mr. Hainer, and I do have to identify the fact that Mr. Hainer's wife, Bonnie, and I were classmates in the Arlington High School class of 1964. So we just recently celebrated our 50th graduation anniversary. I also want you to know that I have two children. One who graduated in the class of 1999. He is currently a, mili a military JAG officer. He's a lawyer for the military and a daughter who graduated in the class of 2003, and this coming May, she will follow in my footsteps and graduate from the Simmons College School of Social Work. She makes me very proud. I have okay. who were students in Arlington, at Arlington High in the teens, 1917. I have a great uncle in the class of 1917. My father graduated in the class of 1932. So my children were the fourth generation. When they were finishing up, there were fifth generation members of my family in the school system. So I am a very proud Arlington person, a townie, so to speak. <laughs> But the Elizabeth and George L. Sanborn Foundation is an organization, it's a nonprofit charitable foundation that one of the things we have to do is give money away. And Lori is going to do that tonight. <laughs> Thank you, hi, good evening everyone. Um, so the main purpose, mission of the Sanborn Foundation is to help Arlington treat, cure, and prevent cancer. It was um, endowed with money from a couple that lived on Lake Street in the 1930s. Um, Elizabeth Sanborn had um, died of breast cancer when later on um, George's estate, his, her husband, when he passed away, he had given um, money for a cancer hospital in Arlington um, and though it was a good deal of money it was not enough to actually build a cancer hospital in Arlington so it's uh, been transformed into this foundation. Uh, we are here tonight to present the um, Arlington Public Schools uh, with a check for $35,000 uh, in support of the K-12 uh, anti-tobacco program. Um, a very important program. It's a program we've actually been supporting for 16 years. Uh, in the 
total is about uh, $578,000 that we have supported over those 16 years for this program. Um, this program has a lot of important elements, um, starting with, you know, Charlene Newell's work in the elementary schools as the cigarette lady, uh, getting those young people very early on to think about uh, use of tobacco. Uh, the Good Choices program at the middle school, the 84 Club, which uh, emphasizes that there are 84% of the young people, I believe it's at the high school, do not use tobacco products. And so it emphasizes positive uh, behavior rather than focusing on those who um, do smoke. Um, the funds also uh, support the smoking monitoring program in the school, in the high school. The, uh, the school's relationship with Relay for Life um, in June. There's a, a community hypnosis uh, session that's done every year uh, where the community is invited to participate in hypnosis to help with um, stopping smoking. Um, and what we've been seeing over the years is that it, these programs work. They, mm -hmm. The youth uh, behavior survey that gets done every couple years, the middle school and the high school, that the percentage of young people in Arlington who are using tobacco products has declined, mm -hmm. and it is not just declined over the years, but it's lower than it is for the uh, statewide average. So Arlington is doing something different and something special to reduce the use of tobacco in our young people. Um, so tonight we're pleased to again uh, support this program. It's for the uh, school year um, beginning in September. And we're, you know, for us it's important. It's a way of preventing cancer in Arlington. You get to the young people early on. Tobacco use uh, as a young person is totally uh, linked to continued tobacco use as an adult. And as we all know, tobacco use is very much connected to cancer. So mm -hmm. it's a very important program to us at the Sanborn Foundation. And we're just very happy to be able to continue to support the program, helping Arlington to be healthier and to live um, you know, free or freer of cancer uh, into the future. Thank you. On behalf of the Arlington School Department, I truly appreciate this and ho hopefully in the future we'll maintain this partnership. Thank you again very, very much. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. At this time, um, uh, fiscal 16 budget up, uh, update and finance presentation. <coughs> well, let me just make a comment sure. if I could about Sanborn. Oh, I'm the, sorry. The, the, uh, Ms. August gave a long list of, uh, of activities, but I even have a longer list from Cindy Bouvier, who, who has been managing this grant, and Carly Newell, of course, has been instrumental, but there has been an effect in every single level of our school district because of this grant, and we remain very grateful. Thank you. It is, I, I once wrote an article that was published in the Advocate about the Sanborn Foundation, and I called it a precious it is. Which is what it is. Yep. And I really have to say, and I say this all of the time to clients, most of the money that we give away goes to individuals, individuals who need help when they're going down this path. Um, most, um, it, it's, you know, as I said, it's a precious gift, and the town of Arlington, the community of Arlington is so so lucky to have it. There is not another organization like this in the state. So, thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, if you have questions, I gave you all our old brochure. We're going to have a new sexy brochure tomorrow, <laughs> but also my card. Please tell people if you know anyone in your neighborhood, relatives who live in Arlington. Please spread the word that we are here and we are here to assist people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, FY16 budget. Um, well, 
a number of the members of this committee were there that, that evening also and probably want to make a comment. We presented our, our budget. It's, it's, part of the, it's part of the process that we, we go through. Um, and Finance Committee then, in turn, will recommend a positive vote for funding at town meeting. And last night they did um, have a vote and, and did make the, um, uh, a positive vote for recommend, recommending our budget. There, we, we spent um, about two and a half hours, was it? It's about two and a half hours of really ta answering a lot of questions. There were a lot of very good questions uh, about, um, about the budget, uh, particularly a lot of questions around special education. And I think that there's some more information that we're going to provide the Finance Committee, one of which is an update on the updated version of our 10-year um, year uh, I would say that it's, it's sort of the 10 year um, expenses of special education. And in fact, I don't know, Diane, if you would like to just sort of jump in here right here, right now, in terms of what that study is. The school committee has seen it in the past. I'm really trying to get rid of it. Um, it it's, it's, a, it's a misleading piece of document. I had to develop it when I was first trying to do a retrospective when I got here because I hadn't been here and the chart of accounts had changed twice in the years immediately preceding me. So trying to reconstruct a backwards look at what the expenses had been was challenging to put it mildly. So what ended up happening is I asked the state to give me back the end of the year reports that had been filed digitally. And I was able to construct using that, I was able to build a model that showed that. But from FY11 on, we changed the chart of accounts. We're capturing the data in much greater extent much greater detail, you can really see what we're spending our money on in special education. And I want to get rid of that old report because I have to lump everything into those old categories and people use, people use that report and draw bad conclusions from it because, you know, I basically the, the real power of that report is just the bottom line number. And, and I'm talking to some of the members of the Finance Committee about perhaps we can find a different model because I really want to retire that report. I, it, it just isn't a good demonstration. From FY11 forward, I can give you all the de detail in the world you could possibly want, and we can analyze that in all kinds of ways. So I hope to see the end of that report. Um, but, you know, we'll see. Well, we, <laughs> well it, it, it still provides a, a good insight into the volatility of special education expenses over time. And one of the things that when we did long-range planning, we did spend some time in looking at what the long, what the, really what the average would have been over that period of time. And it, and it was about 7%. And as part of our long range plan for the town, we have um, agreed that we would increase the special education budget by 7% every year while keeping the general operating increase at 3.5%, which has been part of the long range plan. Of course, as you all know, as we move forward in the next couple of years, as part of this next three year plan, Next year, our operating budget will be 3.5%, followed by then 3.25 and then 3.0 in the, in the third year of this. Uh, but that has been the plan. We certainly are going to continue to update our numbers and, and take a greater, a greater look at that. When we move forward into the next plan, it may be that we find that all of the work that we're doing in district to provide um, support for our students not to have to go out of district, all the work that we've been doing with, imp with interventions is going to have the effect of reducing the amount of money we spend for special education. That is actually something we would like to see happen. And um, so as we go forward, uh, this is keeping the data, looking at very closely is, is certainly um, one of our priorities. We also um, have, as you know, the additional funding for the, um, the enrollment growth as well as uh, the replacement for the kindergarten fees, which has remained static, even though the number of students that we have in kindergarten has increased considerably, and um, which also contributes to Chapter 70 income for, for the town, all of which, which goes to the general fund. So whatever revenues, and I think it's important for people to know, whatever revenues come into the town goes into the general fund, including Medicaid, for example, when we collect Medicaid for the district, goes into the general fund. And the money comes out to the schools and to the town departments through this 
formula that we have agreed on for this period of three years. So it's, I think it's important for people to understand that, that that's how we're operating and uh, it, what it does is creates a lot of stability and, and the ability to plan multiple years ahead, which, you know, of which you've seen our plans. So anyway, um, the, I would say that in general the, um, the questions were good. They asked about what relationships were like between school department and, and town and they're very, very good. I think it's an extremely collaborative relationship um, among all the departments. So I think that that is something that Arlington, I'm, I'm sure, wants to know and feel confident it will continue. So I don't know if other members wanted any to. Any members that were in attendance want to say anything? Mr. Pierce? Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to ask a couple questions and then give a comment or two that I had from, from that mm -hmm. uh, meeting the other night. You all build a long-range plan for our needs in our schools. Yes. You, you, you know what you'd like to have in certain years. You, you save some things for doing for the following year, right? And, and by way of agreement with the town in terms of the percentage that we expect and hope to receive, um, it's, it's now changed. And, you know, I know that we can't have a vote as a school committee on the change. I certainly disagree with the change midstream. Um, it, it affects us in that you probably had already presented or prepared a long-range plan for the schools that now has to change. And, and I think that's important for the town to know and for the Finance Committee to know that um, it, it, it's not okay to have an agreement to uh, uh, extend funds to the schools and then change that agreement midway through just to extend uh, another override three or four years. It, it isn't okay. And so I'm not on record for voting for three and a half to 3.25 to three. And, um, you know, the Finance Committee um, last night, apparently uh, one member suggested cutting a million dollars out of the school department's budget. Why? Because that Finance Committee member was perhaps disagreeable with the whole extent of the 7% with the special ed. In some years it's 12%, some years it's 5%. On average it's 7%, it's probably more like 10% every year. But um, suffice to say, I, it seems to me um, disingenuous to say, okay, we want to cut a million dollars out of the school budget and we expect the schools to take it on the chin for 3.25 and 3. Um, now I'm grateful for the town cooperation we've had over the last several years and the town managers have been wonderful in terms of keeping an open ear to all of this but I have to be on record saying that, that this is this is not okay with me thank you yes okay I wasn't able to be at the meeting on Monday I had to alternate things I had to do but um, to speak to mr. Pierce's point about uh, being on record against it I don't think any of us agreed with this idea. It was discussed at Long Range Plan. We expressed in great detail why we thought it was a bad idea, why we did not agree to it. Um, and so it's not like any of us are on record as saying it's okay either. Right. That's all. Yeah. No, we spent a lot of time preparing actually for long yeah. range planning and as to why it was a bad idea right. and why we, they shouldn't do it. Uh, but one of the things, and it's again my age, just struck me. Our student population is increasing. A lot of it is in the kindergarten area. And that agreement, when we went, they fronted that money initially when we went to the full time kindergarten, in condition we did get the chapter 70. Well, that number, as you just stated, is static that we get back out of the, that piece of it is $900,000. As the chapter 70 money continually increases, it would be nice to get a little extra piece for the, at least the kindergarten because that was part of the, the deal. They're, get, they're getting on an average of a half a million dollars extra. It's a great investment on their part uh, to front that money for us. Uh, the town, I think you said it, Mr. Pierce, the issue of continually to extend uh, and, and avoid uh, the potential override. Nobody wants to increase taxes. Nobody wants to have an override. But the reality is Arlington is a great place to come we're growing leaps and bounds we've had a phenomenal presentation tonight of technology that that if we were ever to take the cuts 
without, without fighting back, would we like to have a computer in the building? Never mind what we're doing with these children. And uh, so anyone else want to jump in on this? So it, it's, it's going forward and uh, we're going to give them some more information, uh, one of which is looking at the um, per people spending for uh, Arlington public school system, which is below um, the state average for per pupil. And in fact, this probably is a good segue into um, the, yes. Yes, into the, the letter that uh, Dr. Allison <coughs> Ampey would like to have the school committee consider. Dr. Rampey. Okay, I forgot that I might actually have to talk about this. I was too busy writing it. Um, <laughs> you don't have to. So, well, I should, but I mean, I don't have anything to show. Okay, so we have a letter. It has graphs, <laughs> <laughs> it has three graphs. Dan had another graph that would have been included had I thought of it soon enough and talked to her, but it didn't fit. Um, anyway, what, so what this is all about, I've talked about it before, but the Foundation Budget Review Commission was created this year by the House and Senate um, and is charged with looking at the state's formula for creating what a budget for a school should be, what, what an average school should take, not excessive, but sort of average, and how much money should it cost. And there's this, the original formula was done back in 1993, I don't know. N yeah, and hasn't, it's been reworked in terms of lumped into different categories, but it hasn't really been adjusted significantly except a little bit here and there for inflation since that time. And people are finding that the spending that schools need to do in different areas is drifting greatly from what the foundation budget thinks that we would spend. And so this commission was created to look again at the formula and to help determine what a more reasonable, well, they're actually not totally sure what they're going to come up with, but the hope is that they will make some effort in describing where the current foundation budget falls short, what needs to happen, who knows, but hopefully something. And so they've been collecting testimony. We missed all of their dates, um, but they are collecting testimony at least until the end of this month, and they are taking written testimony just as well as spoken. So I sat down and took, I pulled from the um, Department of Education website our actual spending over multiple years, and then what our foundation budget is supposed to be, and I just matched them up just category for category and they don't match so good um <laughs> shocking <laughs> and um uh, and so i basically wrote that up and wrote up where we see the biggest differences what some of the reasons we think we see some of these differences and then as i wrote um linda hansen of the aea had been interested in doing something somewhere and she thought we could combine forces so we kind of stuck our various testimony together um, and that is the end result and um, I don't know Karen did you get the very last update that I said okay so what you guys have is the last update um, and so my hope is that um, we will authorize Bill to sign it on our behalf um, and that the superintendent would sign it that the AEA will sign it. Um, and then actually, if I have the committee's indulgence, um, town manager Adam Chapdelaine has said that he would like to sign it. Um, I have reached out individually to some of the board of selectmen, but I'm not sure the message got totally through. But at least one of them is interested in signing it. And what I'm trying to do is just say, you know, this is the problem and we all agree it's a problem and um that was in part when the hansen's idea that it's just it's kind of more powerful to, that all of these different people who maybe we have like we just said we have competing interests with the town that we don't agree with all the financing but that we all identify and agree to this so um i'll entertain a motion for the purpose of discussion so time. moved is there a second second Anyone else 
wish, do you want to speak any further on this at this time? What's the motion? The motion for? is to, uh, did you present oh. it to have me, okay, to have to you let sign it be it. written and for the people and in our to organization talk. to sign it and, to sign. and pass it forward for further okay. signatures. Okay. So Anyone else wish to speak? It has, it has to go in. It has to go in Monday. Yeah. And so sooner. So it okay. may be electronic signatures that we have or who knows. No, I, I just Which, wanted to say thank you. I mean, yeah. I read through it. I learned stuff. Um, I think that, you know, I really want to see this uh, out there. This is the kind of information I think that everybody in town actually really needs to know. Like, you know, this is, you know, how well we're running your schools. I loved that, you know, that we were well below. Not only are we below the state average, but if you look at the town manager 12, our average is below um, what we spend per pupil. And um, just showing people that we are doing the homework. You know, we've done the homework. Here's what the foundation says this should cost. And this is what it's really costing us. And you can't it, there's no denying that, you know, and I just really, I just want to commend you and really thank you for, for all that work. I'm more than happy to sign on to it. I, I would also ask that two things, that we get this on our web page once it's mm -hmm. signed, yeah. and I would ask the newspaper to, to consider publishing it in, in Toto. I mean, it's a powerful message. Uh, I think it's important for the entire community to see this, that uh, we're always asking for money, but we're doing a heck of a job. Right. We, we're, we're in the, the you folks we. are doing a heck of a job. I'm sorry. The Take we. part of the, the the credit for it. I just want to say it's like a, it's an excellent tutorial on how the finances in our town and in the school district. So thanks for doing this. Yeah. yeah. It was a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. There's a lot of spreadsheets that well, I've been it, doing. It, it shows. It, it, ref it reflects a phenomenal job. Really um, good. Really good. It's all those, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone Aye. dare oppose? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, no, Karen. Okay. If uh, so, I'll, together, I'll I will, work. I, I'll make myself available tomorrow for signature. Yeah, I'll work with you, Karen, to figure out where it needs to go. And what we may do is actually send a quick version in, and say this: the actual paper. The, we could send this with just the names of people. I mean, we can send the the type not on letterhead and everything in with the names of people and say that the PDF is coming so that we can get it in earlier. Um, and so I'll reach out to the other selectmen and stuff and, and find out. Okay. Thank you. So. Okay. Uh, statement of interest, Arlington High School. Would you like a motion initially and then we'll... Uh, Yes, there's a very specific motion that must be made, and, and they they have a copy of this in there, right in your yes. document for, for approval of school committee vote. It starts with <coughs> the first line is resolved. Oh wow! Do we have, do we have to read that? I yes. do. We, well, we need yes. We should yeah. read it out loud, and it, Karen has a copy of it, so she could just put it in her notes. Oh boy. Resolved, having convened in an open meeting on March 26, 2015, prior to closing date, the school, the school committee of Arlington, in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the statement of interest dated on or before April 10, 2015, for the Arlington High School located at 869 Massachusetts Avenue, Arlington, Massachusetts, which describes and explains the following deficiencies and the priority category category, excuse me, for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. Three, prevention of loss of accreditation due to the poor state of the facility. Four, prevention of severe overcrowding expected to result from increased enrollments currently being experienced at the elementary and middle school levels. Five, replacement, renovation or modernization of school facility systems such as roofs, windows, boilers, heating, and ventilation system to increase energy conservation and decrease energy related costs in school facility as is consistent with a complex of buildings whose last major renovation took place more than 30 years ago. Seven, replacement of or addition to obsolete buildings in order to provide for a full range of programs consistent with state and approved local requirements as needed to bring a structure, sections of which are not less than 30 years and some sections as much as 100 years old up to modern educational standards of safety, security, and comfort and hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting this statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or approval of an application, the awarding, the awarding of a grant or any other funding commitment 
from the Massachusetts School Building Authority uh, commits the town to fulfilling an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. So moved. Is Second. Set? Further right. discussion? May we have better luck this year. Well, <laughs> well I, let me, I, I just think well, a few comments right on ahead. this. We, we're not just submitting the same report exactly that we had submitted last year. We've, we've actually gone through each one of these sections and looked at it very carefully and have expanded on a number of things and reprioritized some sections. Um, we had a, um, a meeting last week, facilities meeting, and one of the issues that was brought up is that um, Saugus had submitted an SOI in 13, had not checked priority one. There are different priorities that you can check, but did check it in 2014 and receive funding. Uh, so we looked at very carefully, you know, Saugus has changed SOI to see what applicability for Arlington, and we went literally through it very carefully, point by point. What we, what we understand uh, both from conversations with MSBA and also the architect who helped us with the study here is that priority one is for when you say the building's literally unsafe to be in. And, um, and, and they're looking for it ready to fall down or something major that is a security system that is just not, doesn't isn't going to um, provide the security or the access that students should have. Now, we have a lot of deficits in this building. There's no doubt about it. And they only increase with age. One of which uh, that has increased with age is the permeability of this building. One of the things we saw this year, uh, this winter, is that we were getting a lot more moisture into the building. And if you were up here on the sixth floor, you would have seen buckets in different places. And other places around the school, you would have seen trash cans in the middle of, the, of, a, of a hallway or a classroom collecting the water. So it, it's, it's, what happens with masonry is that once you start having this permeability, there's, it almost, is, as our director of facilities has said, it becomes exponential. So we may actually uh, do a study on this. We did this with Hardy. And, um, Hardy's mortar, as a result, has had to have major, major repairs. I think in nature, about two hundred thousand. No, it's more than that. The entire project is now slated at four hundred thousand dollars. And it, so, what happens with the high school is when you get to get to this building and you have to do that kind of um, maintenance, you have to say, does that make sense in terms of the the age of the building and perhaps what would be a, a possible renovation. So I think this is one thing that we uh, um, highlighted a little bit more. The other issue is just looking again, very, you know, emphasizing the security issues in this building and the costs. Uh, it, to, we talked at the last meeting about having crash bars that have alarms. We've already talked to, um, to had some discussions about this and to do that a kind of alarming and, and feedback to a central place, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. And again, you say, do you put that kind of an investment in a building that has uh, the kind that, that needs the massive amounts of repairs? So we, we I think we did um, uh, some, some very good restructuring. And there was a lot more we could have said, but you're limited to 5,000 characters in some of the sections. So we had to trim it back and re rewrite it. So I think that. Um, that piece was redone and we really uh, changed, we really beefed up um, priority number five. We also uh, did an update on the enrollment and I don't know, um, Johnson, if you'd like to say anything about that because th that was your work. Um, in the packet, you'll notice that um, there are two at the end of the SOI, if you scroll through this, there's a cover letter for me that explains the mathematics of how I do the projections. And there's two, one's the one you saw in the fall and the other one is taking the kids that are either born but not yet in school or in school and rolling them out through middle and high school and it subtotals the, the enrollment at the middle school and the high school. And I reference in the SOI the five years out, ten years out numbers and it's a lot of kids. <laughs> 
So, you know, hopefully, you know, and it's, it's up from last year. It, it's, it's more pressure now. And I'm hoping that, you know, it, that in a timely way, the MSBA will, will have a com competition pool that will allow us to rise to the top before it becomes truly critical. Um, that's right. We have the high school, while there's certainly space issues here, the large enrollments that we're seeing in the elementary are still a number of years from here. But if you were to begin this project going to eligibility next year, that, that, those elementary students are going to be here by the time you complete the project. Because <coughs> just, just the lead into the project is probably two years. And then the, whatever is going to follow after that is going to be in the three-year range. So what we're trying to do is anticipate that the building is ready when those numbers come here. Um, so that part was um, emphasized. And um, so we're looking for you know, your approval tonight. The process is the same as, last, as the last time we submitted a statement of interest. Um, it has to have the signature of the school committee as well as the Board of Selectmen. And so we've given all these materials and the backups that will go with um, the um, statement of interest to the Board of Selectmen. And in fact, I'm going to attend their meeting on Monday okay. just to, you're gonna be there too? All right. Both leaving negotiations at the same time then. <laughs> um, so, so we will um, be presenting, well, I don't know if we're gonna be so much presenting, but it's having an opportunity to support, to, to support it and to answer any questions that the, the Board of Selectmen have. So after we have the signatures, then we will be submitting it uh, to MSBA. Uh, we submit it through a security portal, but then we also send a hard copy of all the materials um, to, to them, and then we wait. And what is the uh, deadline for finding out this time? Well, this last year it was in December. Um, it, I, they haven't announced that. It, it seems to vary a little bit. There's sometimes little indicators all of a sudden if, if site visits and stuff ahead of time. They do, they do um, some studies uh, at sites. And um, so when, we'd weren't, when I found out another district had had their study, I immediately picked up the phone and said, so Arlington's not having a study. So there was little <laughs> indicators along the way, but they didn't say definitely. So. Um, I don't think we will know anything probably to next December <coughs> is my Just understanding. Put it on my calendar. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't get anxious until after, after Thanksgiving. After Thanksgiving. After okay. Thanksgiving, it's not to get anxious. New Year's. We all set? Okay. Yep. All those in okay. favor? Uh, <laughs> all those in favor? I just have one question. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, there's a lot of stuff. It, it's a it's, um, very strong case, I think. Um, I was just wondering if we've had pictures as well. If you look in the, the attached documents, there's two reports that include pictures. Oh, okay. I, I, I did look so at the So there, there's no place I... to attach pictures within the Got SOI okay. itself, but the supplementary reports, one from HMFH and one from Onsite Insight, both include pictures. I had read that earlier, so oh, good. Read it. Okay, great. Thanks. All set? Okay, yes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? It's approved. Okay. Thank you. Uh, superintendent's report. It's real short. Well, uh, one of the things that we've talked about is wanting to have some updates on district goals as we go along. And it always seems like there's so, so much going on. And, and I will limit a little bit tonight to a couple of things that I want you to be aware of. Um, one of the, 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 one of our goals under goal three was to complete a feasibility study for the Stratton Elementary School. And that certainly happened and we've gone through a process this year of the Capital Committee um, looking at the report that the Stratton Building Committee uh, prepared for the, for the Capital Committee, looking at what the scope of work would be to have Stratton be, have same, have, uh, be on parity with the other elementary schools. And um, we also gave them options of phase in. As you all know, uh, the recommendation has been to concentrate it, just do it, and have it be over the 14 months, which was one of the, one of the options. So Capital Committee has 
voted uh, to recommend the funding for Stratton, and just a week or so ago, they voted to for the relocation cost. And I think that's one of the things that is of great interest. In fact, this evening uh, before the meeting, I because I knew I was going to be talking about this tonight, I sent a um, a memo to so many people involved in this. It's, it's you know the Stratton community, and then all of the all of the rest of the of the Arlington Public Schools, people that are in the schools, the staff, uh, where we where we are right now with this. Um, as this this winter, um, Ms. Johnson and Ms. Mark Miano, who is our superintendent of facilities for the whole town, um, met with an architect and also a contractor who installs portable, um, mo um, modular classrooms. And to look at all of our different school sites as to which schools would meet a number of criteria. And there were, there were a, num a lot of criteria. In fact, you may even want to talk a little bit about it, then I'll talk where we're going with this. Okay. We, we went around the whole district to see where it would be possible to put modulars in. And, you know, obviously from a transportation standpoint, having them on fewer locations is better, um, keeping a cohort together as much as possible. Unfortunately, we're a densely populated semi-urban area where putting 18 classrooms worth of portables on one lawn is not really going to get it. So um, we, we have settled on, with the help of the architect, um, we have settled on three locations that are best suited. And the reason there's some real questions about suitability is the modulars don't stand apart from the building. There's, a, there's an access way that's built. I, I guess the best analogy would be like a jetway when it goes out to the plane. There'll be something built um, temporarily so that children enter and leave the modulars from inside the building mm -hmm. so they won't be wandering around to get to class. The modulars would have um, exits, so if they need to leave the modulars, they could go out. But normal, you know, for fire drill or something, but normal would be through that corridor that'll be built. So you need grade and you need, you need other factors to go. So the three locations we're looking at currently are um, the Bishop and the Hardy. And as, if you think about their sites, there, there's some nice flat areas near the building. And those would be temporary modulars, so they'd basically be in place only for the duration of the Stratton project. And then the Audison, we would put in modulars, but we would put them in more permanently so that after the Stratton students went back to the Stratton, there would be additional classroom space at the Audison, which really needs it. And so this has allowed us to consolidate some funding that was set aside to help the Audison and the Stratton costs to sort of kill two birds with one stone here. That's right. Um, since since we're... Um we're looking at relocation for Stratton. Um, the very fact that we might be able to address some of the, the space needs at Audison as a result of it has really been a wonderful, um, a wonderful thing. So at the, at the Audison Middle School, um, most likely it would be the fourth and fifth grade that would go there. And I know that once we start talking about this, people are going to have a lot of questions. And what about this? What about that? <coughs> what I can say is that we're starting early with the most important things of identifying the sites. Now, it is possible that when we actually go out to bid, it could, could change. But right now, they, they did a pretty thorough analysis of all of the, the building codes and how you could attach utilities. and. So I think we're pretty, uh, pretty set on these sites. Um, we've even begun looking at what the busing would be like. But we have a year to plan. The important thing is to get the big things in place so that we're ready to go. And it is going to be a much, more, um, uh, a much bigger project than the Thompson move. It, because you're not, go you're not going to a school. You're going to, these, um, to different locations. Um, and there, unfortunately, we would have loved to have had it all be closer to Stratton than they are. But the fact, the fact is, the modulars have to work on a site. Um, that's the most important thing. Because unless you can act, we want the students to be able to access through the building because that's part of the security of the, uh, the, the modular uh, classrooms. So there'll be a lot of questions. And, I, and I, there's going to be things that can't be answered right now, but there are some important things that I can say, and that is we've, we've talked to the after-school program at Stratton, and we are going to be working out a plan 
that the, they will be divided between the sites next year. So they're very flexible and w willing to support this, and it is a year. Uh, and it, it's important to make sure that everything is ready to go because it is going to be a tight construction plan and we do not want to arrive in September of 2017 and not be ready to reopen. So all we're going to do is much upfront planning and ready to, ready to, ready to go. Don't, I just wanted to clarify, don't I remember you saying that one of the big things is that the modulars take a year to prepare yes. I mean you have to order them a year ahead so that's part of why we can't just do this like a few months you know, do no. all the planning first and then do it you're absolutely so. right so the first thing we have to do is move forward in getting the designers and those bids out and then we're going to package that this with the designer because it's really, I think it makes sense not to have different bids on the on the on the modulars and perhaps we'll even get a better price as well so that all has to happen, and we should be ready to be ordering it um, <coughs> we have the, the finances from approved by town meeting. I just want to make it clear to everyone listening that you know th this is the planning year. We're talking about this disruption 2016-17. Yes. So it's not next school year. It's not this summer. Right. But it's, a year, it's a year plus from now. It's so a year plus from now. A lot of time to... Uh, so work on the logistics, discuss it, have community participation. First time. That's correct. I'm going to have my first meeting with Stratton parents and Stratton staff in the, in the next um, week or so. So that will happen. But there, we're already starting to compile lists of details that have to be addressed, and they will be a, they're significant. And um, but uh, unless you plan well, it will. That's what. Planning well is what will ensure that it will move, go forward smoothly. Just want to emphasize, you, you stated it, but the first hurdle we have to get over is through town meeting to get finance approved. That's mm -hmm. coming up in the next, next month or so. Mm -hmm. so. Yes? All right. Um, I just wanted to, to let everybody know that it, the Finance Committee did vote unanimously to support the capital yeah. budget, including mm -hmm. the Stratton and the relocation costs. Yes. So that's, that's very bodes well for town meeting. Yes. Actually, I have a question about cost, um, and also about: Are the modulars at Audison going to be different in type because they're per permanent? And um, are we leasing them? Are we buying them? What is sort of the plan? That's what that's what we need the designer to spec out for us okay. because we want to put it out to bid so it meets our needs. So we'll have some modulars that are temporary, some that are permanent, and where's the lease? by breakover point in terms of cost effectiveness. Right, okay, so we so, don't know that yet. No, that'll all be part of the specking. You know, it okay. could be that, you know, so many lease, so many buy, mm -hmm. you know, or give us your best pricing and we'll see. It might be cheaper to buy, it might be cheaper, you know. We have to look at all that. We want to get the best price. Actually, if we, if we were to buy them, could we then use them at different places as, as our enrollment goes? The, the um, modulars they, don't like to be moved around a whole lot. Um, it, it, they're kind of like a prefab building. Okay. And once you, you know, when you establish them permanently, they have to meet ADA compliance, and, and you really, you really dig in. Okay. And so the, it's not simple. Mm -hmm. Because I was just looking at the uh, enrollment projections in 2019, every single elementary school class will be over 500, according to our current projections. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. Well, you're leading into another. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, another part of the part of this but uh, I did want to make one comment further on this is that parking will be need to be addressed at Audison and we do have plans for how that will be addressed mm -hmm. um, and the other important part is that people students will be bused right. to these different locations and we're wor even starting now working on what that might look like um, I just wanted to one question that came up at facilities last week was whether the money for the relocation was in capital plan for fiscal 17 and some that was going to be looked into and i was just wondering there there's that, a split okay that there's a, a a much larger portion than would normally be there for design cost mm -hmm. so that would include the bid and the contracting for the modulars because you have to pass papers mm -hmm well in advance of the order but mm -hmm. you don't actually start paying them a tremendous amount of money so that oh the, okay so, so there's like the design phase mm -hmm. and the you know and you could go out to bid on the modulars get your best price get them set up get them ordered 
Okay. And then you can... the money will come yeah. around the next year. Okay. So okay. We've, we've been That's... thinking about that. We've, we've worked mm -hmm. on that. We think we're in good shape with that. That didn't, all of that didn't come through and I just didn't want us to have them and not be able to pay for them. <laughs> Well, we won't have them. Well, I mean, not have them. We wouldn't be able to order them because we couldn't pay for them. But that's no. fine. If they'll wait until the money comes, that's good. Yeah, we, we don't pay for things until we get them. Okay. So. Yeah. Right. Well, we've been talking about the enrollment growth, and this is a nice segue into this. But let's just talk for, about Audison for a second. We have classes that are now coming up through the elementary school, third grade, and 470, and then they there's a pretty much sort of in, hovering in the high 400s, and then our kindergarten class is 513 right now. Um, and we, if we were to see even 90% of the number of, stu of children that were born that would be next year's entering class, we could, we could have a very, even a larger L, uh, kindergarten than 513 next year. Because I think the number of um, births for that group was about 560, 560. This, this year, we had the first time sort of a one-to-one -one correspondence between the number of uh, births and the number of kids that entered kindergarten. In the past, it's ranged from a number of years ago to about 83%, and then it went up to 90%. And so even if we had 90% of the 560, we're talking about a large class. Now, these classes are going to, did you want to say? I just wanted to say that four years out, the, the furthest reach of a full year of kids we have, the number of live births is above 600. So if, if we realize 90% of 600, that's going to be a big class. If we realize 100% of it. Start breaking some records. Right. So the, these class, for the next two years, next year and the year after, we can, uh, I, I think with some thoughtful use of space at Audison, really, that'll be fine in terms of the, the classes that are coming in. It's the year of 1718, which is why this project seg segues so well. That's when the first really large class of the element of elementary hits um, Audison. And so I think having six additional classrooms is going to make a, a, a big difference. Um, I think that they're going to be um, desirable space because there will be air conditioned. Um, and they actually, modulars today are very different than the modulars of yesteryear, and they're, they're, very, they're very nice classrooms. And I, I know you were saying that you, you've seen them at, at, in Lexington. The Le Lexington Estabrook, uh, they initially were intended for a short thing. Uh, they don't, I'm sorry, I shouldn't put that down. They don't exist anymore. They have a brand new school there, but they, they st Lexington still has them. Portables, everyone thinks they're, they're the leftovers. They have their own heat and they have their own air conditioning. And they have their own sinks. They have water. The They're smarter, all plumbed, the every teachers, single one of them. Smarter teachers quickly volunteer for the mm -hmm. portal. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, we have them at our school. And, and some schools have had to have them for as many as 10 years, yeah. and they're designed that they could do that. And so I think by having these six classrooms there, we will be able to um, buy a considerable amount of time for Audison in terms of thinking about um, is it this is enrollment going to level off, or do we need to think about um, permanent permanent structures there? But it gives us it buys us a lot of time in being able to do that. Six classroom will be will will work for a number of years. Um, as far as the other schools, we, we already talked about the high school, but the elementary is 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 concerning because we have very few classrooms that are available, um, and. In fact, that in the study of why we need to go to portables, we even saw how few there are, and there are just trends that are happening, such as at Thompson, where our entering kindergarten last year was four classrooms, and it's 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 looking like it could go that direction again this year, and it's only March. So, what we it's a very it's very complicated and so what we decided to do was to actually look for some outside experts to help us do a space study looking first of all to corroborate what we're seeing with enrollment growth have another methodology look at it um, which I think would be good to know and then secondly uh, well actually more than secondly but secondly to take a look at where we are with the, with trends in different parts of town look at the space that we have, what kind of space would we, where would be needing space in the years to come. And, and uh, we put a, um, 
uh, uh, bid quotes out, received different proposals, had to go back and, and talk with the people who gave us the proposals and sort of uh, redefine it a little bit and, and move the cost down to what we had budgeted for this. So after that process, um, the firm that we are going with is HMFH. And so we have already begun um, starting to plan. Uh, we're going to, I've already got an email just before I came in in terms of the demographer and look, asking for the different kind of documents. And the first documents you wanted to have had all to do with buffer zones, which is interesting. <laughs> so that we'll be meeting um, with HMFH. And, and they have, um, it's a, it's, as you know, it's a very solid firm and they have they have the, the deep expertise to really help us think this through. Um, the, we're looking to get a report probably in August or, or early September. I think once we dig into this, we're a little bit off our timeline right now, but um, because we had to go back to the bidders and have them re resubmit a second proposal. So that. I'd, I'd like you to possibly consider, and these are the experts and stuff, uh, Arlington has I don't have to tell you, no space, but the concept, the idea of utilizing some things that the school department is not using itself, but as a, the idea of an early childhood center, which would be pre, any preschool and all the kindergartens in town located in one location. That would provide a growth factor at the elementary schools. Now, is it the best thing for the parents and stuff like that? I don't know, but we're lacking space and the Gibbs building and you, you folks know, would it cost a lot of money? Probably. But whatever it takes, it's going to cost money to, for space with the way we're going. Is it feasible? I don't know. That's why we're having the expert, well, experts a, come. The, the school itself would require millions and millions to make it ADA compliant. Um, but, but the issue is the number of kids. If we have classes of 500, you have 500 kindergartners and, and our preschool, which will be oh, probably over 100 in one site. I, I don't know. I mean, these are all um, the kinds of questions right. we have, and I think it's something, it's another option we have to consider. We, mm -hmm. either that or we have to start considering, I don't even know if we can, going vertical, because we don't have any spread out space. You were limited to where you could locate the uh, portables, because some of the buildings just did not have physical areas to put them in for the hookups and everything like that. So that shows you that expansion space doesn't exist in, in, in Thompson is one of them. Uh, you can't go left and right or... or but anyway, we don't want to get ahead. Anyway. But, but anyway, the space, the space study is, um, is going to be ongoing. If I have any updates, I'll certainly let you know as we go along. And the facilities committee will probably want to get regular updates on that too. Um, another... Uh, dist uh, so... heard a lot about the technology just to tonight, but I wanted to just do a couple other things. And one has to do with the, one of the goal about recruiting and hiring and retaining diverse staffs, staff of out, that are outstanding. Um, and Rob has been doing a lot of work on that in terms of going out to job fairs, but I also wanted to have you talk about the coffee that we're gonna be doing. Sure, so I've been to some job fairs recently. We participated in the MPDE job fair, the Mass Partnership for Diversity, Diversity in Education job fair a couple weeks ago. Um, the turnout wasn't as great as we, we had hoped, um, but we are hosting a coffee social again this year as we have in years past. Um, that's going to be on April 8th at four o'clock in this room. And um, we invite the school committee and we have sent invitations to candidates that I've met at job fairs um, and hopefully and, and posted it in some other um, places to inform um, students at different colleges um, of the job uh, of the coffee social and, um, and our diversity committee is going to be working on some recruiting phone calls. Right. Right. And the last thing I wanted to update you on, we had a, a district goal with respect to the website. Um, as the town found, it's, it's much more complicated uh, to, be, to do a whole cloth change of our website in which we would also bring in the, the school websites into a, a coherent system. So short term, we are working on um, uh, basically making our current 
website more efficient. And we have a prototype that's working on sort of separately, and then we'll eventually have it go live. But we still have more to work on with it. But the other issue, but having a more substantial change in our website requires a, an important decision, and that is whether you, we have a hire a content manager. Right now, we don't, we basically run our own website. Claudia Bertoli is our webmaster, and she manages, manages the site. The school websites, um, while they're linked to the, linked to the district website, are managed either by a teacher in the building or a vo parent volunteer, and they're linked in. One of the things that would happen if we go in the content manage uh, direct direction is that we'd have much more management uh, sort of centrally. So we're, we've, we've had some meetings already. We're continuing to meet. We've met with the director of communication for the town and, and how with the process that they went through and I think the, the, next pla the next place we're going with this is actually getting some people to come in from content management firms and, and give us a presentation. So it's moving forward. I do not think that we will have a, uh, a brand new website for until a year and a half at least. It's, it's, it's quite a project. The, the town took well over two years on it. But I do think that you're going to see um, come late spring, early summer, a much more trimmed and efficient website um, that, that we manage right now. Oh, I just wanted to remind um, everyone that our last uh, community relations subcommittee, uh, we talked about soliciting um, community involvement in mm -hmm. some way. Um, right. And I was wondering sort of what, what time, would that be appropriate to do now or is that something? We're we thinking of doing a survey later this spring with parents, short survey, just trying to find out what are the types of things that they most want to find on the website. We also, we also talked, and actually this was actually something, you had, you had stepped out, you had, you had something else that you were doing. Um, we talked about um, asking for applications from community members uh, for people who might want to be on a committee to sort of get involved in this. Okay. Can we do that? Yes, we okay. Do um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, but at any rate, we're just moving forward. And the other the last thing I will just mention is um, well, two things, real quick. Shrek is this weekend, and it, from people who have seen the dress rehearsal, say it's fabulous. It is a great show to bring your children to. And they're putting on matinee on Sunday, which we only do when we, we run shows that, um, for, that would have a wide audience of young children. So um, that went out as a reminder to parents. And the other thing, I just want to congratulate our music department, particularly um, Tino D'Agostino and the Honors Orchestra. They were, ch they were chosen among hundreds of applicants to perform at the um, Music Educators Conference in Boston. And um, uh, I attended, as did Dr. Janger, and I, I have to say they were extraordinary. They were excellent. You would have been so proud of them. I wish that they had recorded them because we were thinking of linking the, their, uh, one of their pieces to the newsletter, but we're still trying to work on that possibility. But it, 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 when, when they have concerts here at school, and I think we need to do a better job of advertising them, because I think that people would be bowled over by how good our students are. So I just want to thank them publicly for making us so proud. Thank you very much. This time we're to do the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant number 15122 dated March 12, 2015 in the amount of $643,068.73. Approval of minutes, regular school committee meeting, March 12, 2015 and the second public hearing on F fiscal 16 budget meeting minutes, March 12, 2015. So moved. Second. Any, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Subcommittee and liaison reports. Uh, policy and procedures. Mr. N Pierce. Nothing at this time. Uh, let's see, budget, Ms. Starks. All right, hopefully my last budget report. Mm -hmm. Next Three year. years, no. 
Mm-hmm. Here's hoping I don't get it again. Nope. Um, anyway, so uh, we had a meeting just before last week, before we went to see the Finance Committee, and we focused on the Finance Committee uh, report, as uh, Dr. Bodhi said. I think it went very well. Um, I actually took notes so that I can hand those off to whoever is chair next year about what there were over 30 questions, um, and I'm trying to put those together so that uh, we kind of know what they asked. I think it would be good to go in with that next time. Um, We have another subcommittee meeting on, ooh, I put it in here, and now I can't read it, Wednesday, April 15th, um, where we will uh, talk about the book that's going to town meeting um, and make sure that that's ready, because that has to go off to the presses to be ready and on the chairs for April 27th. That's it. Community relations. Is there anybody from that committee that would like to speak to it? I guess not. Well, actually, we reported yeah. on it last time, so yeah, okay. we're good. Anything else at this time? Um, no, I don't. I don't think. No, we, we haven't met since. Yeah. Okay. Curriculum instruction, assessment, and accountability. Nothing to report right now. Thank you. Facilities, Mr. Thielman. We met on the 19th. Kathy covered the main points. Um, the only thing I would add is that we had a report on the Stratton, uh, the no, the Hardy playground, and. Um, we are. Uh, the, we received a bid. That the, the district received a bid to, re, to repair the Hardy Playground that was over our budget, and you're trying to find money to do it. Do I have it right? Yes, you do. Good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, that and everything you else. know, we had some other discussions about some of the other things. I mean, the with the turf. Uh, if town meeting approves the capital plan, which should happen, then the turf will be replaced this summer mm. at the high school. Do we have timing for Hardy? Do we have an, a sense of when we'd start? That trying to find the money. Final requests. Well, we have so some final money, requests right? for um, final purchase orders are due in in April before mm-hmm. the vacation, and once we process all of those, we'll have a better but sense of where our balances. Start this summer. I, I'm sure hoping to squeeze out right. some money <laughs> for the Hardy. Okay, great. Uh, Special study group on superintendent's evaluation. Before you, in, in your package, there were uh, four goals and a questionnaire that the subcommittee has prepared for you. Uh, the goals are for the superintendent's evaluation. Two of them you've had in the long, uh, before. Um, if uh, I can entertain, uh, I don't know the correct procedure. Can I entertain a motion to, to accept the, the, three, uh, the four goals and so the questionnaire? Moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Did, did people look at the questionnaire? Um, I really need some feedback on well, <laughs> the you, questions. You, you did a good job going through it. Yeah, but uh, I'm the only, I mean, us and you know the three of us are the only ones to have looked at them. So anyway, if people can take a look at that, I mean, today is just a first look. It's not like we have to vote on it. But well, um, you know, anything that we felt like what we were trying to get at was the information that we knew we needed to do the superintendent's Mm -hmm. review. So if you think, like in the past, that there have been things you didn't have enough information on or you would like to have had information on, the point of the questionnaire was to kind of say, okay, um, these are, you know, we plan to give this to curriculum leaders and administrators Mm -hmm. in hopes that we have more information so that when we do the review. This um, this is required by statute from DESI. It's not just something out of it. It would be great if we thought of it, but Desi is requiring this uh, as part of the uh, superintendent's evaluation. So uh, there was a suggested uh, questionnaire. It was, what, about four or five pages long. Yeah. Cindy, and I I want to give her credit for this, took the time over the uh, Christmas Christmas holiday, spent hours upon hours. But she weeded it down to, to relevant. I think we, we took one or two more uh, out of it at the last meeting. Yes. Is there anything that describes what output it has to have from Desi? I mean, no. You mean no. specific to who, who would go to? No. Well, I mean, just so oh, we, just have, we to have, have to have a question. We have to have a questionnaire, have have a questionnaire okay, yeah, but there's nothing and that we, we can have either to use do. theirs or make our own. But I'll but modify. but there's nothing there's nothing specified with what you do with the what you do yeah. with the information. Okay, yeah. that that's I we, just want to check. We we have and the, the way I set up. I saw, I talked to uh, Mr. Good about doing. We have the package within the district of a confidential thing. It will go out to these people. Uh, the IP address will be contained. There'll be anonymity uh, for anybody participating in this thing. 
he will have control of it, reminded to get it done. That information will come back to us as individuals sometime. Prob we set the date, the end of September, or, or for us to, to look at it and how we want to compile it and how it would be compiled. Um, that information obviously will be given to the superintendent as well, but uh, as part of but it's part of our determination with this uh, to look at it. Mr. Pierce and then. A couple quick questions. Why are um, some of the items bold and, and other questions don't have any bold? That, that is, okay, so is, that won't is, be the, no, okay. No. And I don't think that may be just way. the formatting of going into notice. Oh, okay. And then the second question I had was, well, you know, say you're um, a principal yep. and you're filling this out and you don't know the answer to, do well, you that, just leave it blank? Do you know the last energy. choice was? Yeah, there, there's okay. a. One of the choices no, is not applicable or. Oh, okay. Yeah. So those are, the, those are the choices you have to fill in each one. Strongly disagree, right, right, right. disagree, agree, strongly agree, not applicable. Not applicable. You don't Which have means you may not you interact. Yeah, yeah, right. you don't, yeah, you may right. not interact with the superintendent in that right. way. Got it. That, that particular one. We okay, want to thanks. Make sure they had that. Uh, and we know another thing that is missing is the timeline that we came up with. Right. Well, the, the timeline seems to be more your script. This isn't a policy. I mean, we could vote on it tonight, but I no, no, I, we can't I vote on it tonight. I think it's important. We all have input in this, uh, on this thing here. So the original timeline that we had come up with, and it got modified from the one we passed back in uh, December. We had to jag it a little bit. May have to get a slight adjustment again, because these people should have this in their hands for a while before they make the determination. Should we just bing bing? To think about it. I think anyway. if we're, if we're, we're voting to approve this. No, we're not voting to no, approve this. Nice. No, we know this, this is just a first, like a first read. Okay. First so read. this is just, you know, we wanted to make sure we introduced it, gave you guys a little bit of context, take mm -hmm. a look at it, and next meeting we'll talk more about it, yeah. and, and hopefully ask, maybe then we comments, can. If you have comments, send them to, to Karen. Karen will then send them out to <coughs> myself and Paul. And if we feel that well, all of a sudden we have a slight disconnect. We will call for another meeting. We did not set up another meeting as yet. Right. But we can if we have to. Right. Okay. So it says vote oh. to approve or not vote. I, 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 yeah, okay. sorry. I, no. I, okay. Oh, right. About we have to take that. Yeah. We're not. Um, so I just have a question. I, I will definitely look at this and yep. get comments back to you. Um, Please contact through camera. Yeah, I will. Thank I will you. do that. Um, so my question is, so since last year was my first time looking at that process and I, i've mentioned this before what struck me is at the bottom of that form the 7 to 12 suggested um additional documents that we should see in, in order to, to make the evaluations um that we didn't have and i'm wondering at what time do we decide that we're going to ask as a committee for doc for those types of documents is that is that sort of but, now or does that happen I, I later so yeah Maybe. I know what she's talking yeah. about. It's on that whole template at right. the very bottom in little smaller type. Right. It gives examples of um, documents that documents might help. Documents that may support yeah. um, I would, evidence. I would, I, I, would, I would suggest that individual members that are seeking those communicate. Well, I, th I think maybe we should talk about it as a committee, but which wasn't we might. Well, yeah. well there are four standards mm -hmm. um, that teachers, administrators, superintendents are evaluated on. Um, what we are doing with teachers is that in the different standards, they provide evidence, the three pieces of evidence for each standard. So Karen has set up um, electronic files in which they will be available to you, the different pieces of evidence. Sometimes there are things that go across diff different standards. So there's evidence on the standards and then there's evidence on the goals. So potentially we'll see a lot more, because I remember just feeling that it was just sort of paltry, the kind of evidence that we had. Well, well that's because time. we were only focusing on the goals last time, okay. but we really need to look at the standards. And I think we need to look at all the district goals too, which will be a. Are, the, are these things already set up? Are they accessible by us? What do you mean? If you. you it, it, this is something that will only be accessible to us. I want to make that much. clear. This is not a public document. The only public document that will come out of this is, is the final evaluation that this school committee does come next November. I want to make that clear to the public. So, I mean, Karen, as soon, when you can, send us out a notice that the, this is the, the link to us through Novus 
for the. Uh, but for we the, won't. We won't. At that point, we won't see all the evidence because it's still being it, collated, right? It's no. Not, it oh. will. As Kathy gathers it, as right. it comes in, if you have a question about it, if you want need clar any one of us needs clarification, back through Karen to Kathy in, in a timely manner, Kathy. The idea of this evaluation is to keep it interactive throughout the year. Some of us may choose not to look at any of this until September. Some of us want to may be involved in it on an ongoing basis. So if I'm interested in, in, in sort of different kinds of evidence, and, and not just for me personally, I think maybe the rest of the committee might benefit as well, who does that go to? Is that Karen? That go to Karen. Karen. Okay. We will see any result of that. Okay. Okay. We'll all see any result of that. Okay. I think Ms. Hiss actually has a good point that we may want to have a conversation among the committee at some point about what's, you know, if there's any big buckets of evidence that we would like to see. It's a good, it's a good retreat topic, I think. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think, yeah. Yep. yeah. I think it's a, something Let's put that on the bucket oh, list of okay. retreat yeah. topics. I just would like to share with the group, if this is going to be something that we're going, as a group, going to use in November, we need to have this discussion sooner than later. That's yeah, that's right. exactly. That's, that's why right. she's bringing it up. I'm bringing it up now. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I'm with you. I'm ready for the retreat two weeks from Saturday. Others going to we finding that date is going to be difficult. So maybe we need to ask you to start that doodle doodle. Start well, doodling well, like, again. No, no, start it. I didn't say yeah. pick it. All right. Yep. All right. Okay. We vote. Let's hold the. Let's move on. Okay. I would like to entertain a motion to, uh, to hold the school committee organizational meeting on April 9, 2000. No, we didn't no, vote tonight. We're, 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 we're not supposed to vote. No. We're voting on the other items, right? Pardon? No, we're not. no, that was the first anything. read of everything. We're not gonna, we'll we're vote on treat it, it like next a policy time. First read. How about things like the minutes? Pardon me? We did the minutes. We did the minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can I make a comment? Sure. Go ahead. One of the things that you're going to see in the goals, which, you know, sometimes you don't. Until you sort of dig into some of these things, you don't realize. Um, you'll see that the di some of the district goals that we had picked out, th they don't really match up very well at all with the rubrics. Mm -hmm. And it struck me as I was doing these that um, how much is missing from the job in the rubrics. Right. Uh, and, I, and I suppose teachers doing it might see the same thing. But it, is, it was startling how I was just trying to find something that would even relate to it. So you're going to see a difference in the goals in terms of all of the different uh, correspondences to the rubrics because but it, some things don't match in there. But if we have a retreat, we have the four goals that are looking right there at it. We can determine you're aware of what we're looking for. Yeah. We know what we want. Right. We have that okay. mesh at that time and going forward. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, so, I'll try it again. Entertain a motion to uh, have a, excuse me, school committee organizational meeting April 9, 2015 at 6.15 p.m. So moved. Second. Or second. Second. Okay. Any discussion, questions? Okay. Wait, so oh. what, uh, when is this again? It's just it 15 minutes we come minutes 15 before. minutes early. Oh, 15 minutes meeting. before, okay. And we play musical cheers. Got it. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 At this time, before we go to this time, I want to take a moment. Yes, sir. To mm -hmm. Would you thank? Like to no, I don't want to. No, right To thank our esteemed chairman, Mr. Hayner, for a great year. It was a it was a, it was a terrific year. Uh, Bill did a great job running this committee, keeping everyone in line. Our meetings generally ended fairly early, earlier than we've ever had uh, had that happen before, and uh, it was just a great year. And Bill did a great job. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Uh, and we have cake for you, Bill, in the yes. tradition, which just started for you. It's just we got to take the cake and throw it in the chair. Yes. <laughs> I figured that. It's a new thing. I figured that. So we're just going to do it. Thank you all. I couldn't have done it without you. And thank you for putting up with my mismemory every now and then. At this time, I will entertain a motion to enter executive session to conduct strategy uh, in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union uh, in which, if held in open meeting, may have a detrimental effect. To conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining litigation, in which, if held in an open meeting, may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. To de de to de you got it. You got it. Got it. <laughs> Roll call. Thank you. Uh, yes. 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 Aye. 
Aye. Aye. We will, we will be coming back only for the purpose of adjournment.